Welcome everybody to the Halmstead Colloquium. It's a talk series organized by the two research centers, Ceres and Kaiser, uh, both of which are supported by the Swedish Knowledge Foundation, the KK Foundation. It's a real honor to present to you today Professor Charles Kunsell from the University of Bordeaux. For the last 10 years, Professor Kunsell has been in Bordeaux, both at the University of Bordeaux and leading the Phoenix Group at INRIA in Bordeaux. Before that, he was in uh, Rennes, leading the Compose Group that produced, among many other things, uh, the well-known Tempo Partial Evaluator that was actually highlighted recently in Japan at a Shonan meeting on uh, connecting partial evaluation to high performance computing. And it stood out as one of the big accomplishments of partial evaluation that can have a big impact in the coming years on high performance computing. While, actually in fact in the last 10 years at uh, Bordeaux, uh, Charles helped build, found and build the telecommunications department over there. Um, and stepping back again before, earlier before Bordeaux and Rennes, uh, Charles was at, on the faculty at OGI and Yale universities. During this time, he has produced a prodigious, prodigious number of PhD students, uh, something on the order of uh, 20 PhD students. And he has also uh, founded or helped co-found several conferences, including uh, PEPAM, the Conference on Partial Evaluation, DSL, Conference on Domain-Specific Languages, and also the IFIP Working Group on uh, Program Generation. So now, with all this amazing professional experience behind him, Charles is directing his attention towards automated assistance of handicapped individuals, which I think is something that is of great interest to many people here at Homestead. It's very hard to do justice to Charles in an introduction, so I will, with, this, with these few words, I will let him uh, tell us about uh, the exciting work that he's been doing now. So please welcome Charles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walid. Uh, now I'm all embarrassed to, uh, <laughs> with all those nice things. Um, okay, so uh, I'm very, very, very excited, very pleased to be here. Uh, I've been uh, hearing about um, University of Almstad for uh, a couple of years, actually. Uh, and, um, and so I'm, uh, I was looking forward to this visit, and I'm, I'm really happy with all the discussions I've had and uh, that we'll have uh, uh, in the next two days. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to talk about an approach to develop dependable applications. Uh, this approach, as you will see, is driven by the design of the application. And I will focus on a case study, which is in the domain of avionics. Um, dependable applications, as Walid was saying, um, uh, interested in a variety of topics and this application domain which is avionics is actually also connected to uh, the work I'm doing on assisted living because of course as the person that you are assisting with a um, um, with assistive technologies uh, becomes vulnerable uh, then you need a dependable software system to actually help uh, the, the, these users so so the dependability interestingly enough uh, becomes more and more prevalent in these uh, in these domains, and this is joint work with uh, Emilie Ballon, who uh, I think visited you two years ago, and uh, uh, three of my PhD students, Julien Bruno, Quentin Enard, and uh, Stéphanie Gatti. Just to make a, an interesting note here, uh, those three PhD students are actually funded by Thales, and Thales is a company working in Unix. So this is how the connection. <laughs> Uh, where the connection exists. Okay, so uh, the starting point for a dependable uh, system, in avionics in particular, is that you, you, you start with some uh, functional and non-functional uh, requirements on a particular software system that you're interested in, uh, in, in developing. And so there you have a, 
a bunch of requirements that uh, you would like to express and I guess the problem is that when you have those requirements the, and you don't have much more than that and then a programming language you usually encode those requirements, those functional and non-functional requirements into a programming language right away and that's, that's what we want to avoid and we would like to add an intermediate stage which is this design uh, stage so our approach is to introduce a um, uh, to to introduce a, a, a design approach that's driven by a paradigm, and by paradigm you will see concretely what it means. But the idea is to have some kind of a design framework. Okay, so not something that's general purpose, but something that's that gives you some kind of a framework to design a particular solution for a given problem. We want this paradigm to be as concrete as possible. In order for it to be concrete, we have an underlying design language okay, that will make it um, as concrete as possible uh, in forms of you know, textual abstractions. Okay, and to make it useful, to make these design descriptions uh, uh, useful, what we'll introduce is a compiler that will turn a design description into actual support artifacts for the programmer okay, in order to guide but also to restrict the programmer so in doing so what we want is to be able to verify some safety properties to guide the implementation and ensure the conformance between the design and the implementation so there are lots of challenges that um, uh, can be raised considering uh, the goals that uh, we're, we're facing. One is how to provide the developer with a design framework. So you, you really want to provide some support in order to design software systems, okay? Uh, and you want to make the, the software design as predictable as possible. So in, 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 in a sense, you can design things with whatever notation you're interested in, uh, but the idea is that you'd like the design to be as predictable as possible so that evolution, maintenance, okay, can be helped by, you know, keeping this design as uh, predictable as possible. Another challenge is how you can guide the programming. Essentially, so I've been, I've been doing a lot of work in domain-specific languages and the, the, the usual recurring problem with domain-specific languages is that people are saying, ah, but you're introducing yet another language. So we're not interested. We don't want to, you know, we're interested. We're, we have Java programmers or C++ programmers and, and we can't change our language. So you'd like to leverage the, uh, uh, you'd like to leverage the, the, the mainstream programming language that people are using uh, and to introduce something that can, can help the use of this programming language. So, so how can you leverage mainstream programming language? So you'd like to do the, the programming driven by the design. So somehow to express the design and to guide the programming okay, from the design, that, that's a, a key goal that we want to do. And also we want the, the programming to be supported by the design. So somehow you've said things in the design that could be used to actually support the programming to make it more uh, to, to, to make it um, easier also um, another challenge is how to check a program against the design so this is the conformance assurance you like to say uh, the design is something that you know is I mean you can see that as a as a model in a sense that it's a it's a it's a, an approximation of the actual uh, um, uh, the actual implementation uh, so it's something more concise easier to understand uh, and so what you'd like to do is to say sure I, I've described this thing that's more abstract than the actual program now I want my program to be as coherent as conform as possible to the uh, to the design um, and one last thing that I'll talk about uh, as far as the challenges uh, is how not to code what the programming paradigm doesn't address. So programming languages do 
a few things, okay, but they don't do everything. And so, how can we combine what we say in the design in order to somehow compensate for uh, holes that programming languages have, holes in terms of not dealing, not handling certain features that we are interested in programming and that we have to encode in a kind of a low-level way. Uh, please um, do not hesitate to interrupt um, during this talk uh, if you have questions. I'll be uh, happy to answer. Um, okay, so let's, let's start with the design framework. So what we introduce here is the sense compute control paradigm. So this paradigm, as you will see, is a pretty general uh, paradigm. The idea is that you have some environment here, which is either a physical environment or a digital environment or a hybrid environment, okay? And you have some sources, some entities that will essentially do some measurement on on this environment. So just just measuring things. Uh, this is the sense uh, part of this paradigm. Then you will be using these raw data into uh, by some uh, context functions, context components. Okay, they'll be they'll be using these raw data to do some interpretation, some filtering. Uh, some aggregation. This is the compute uh, part of it. Okay. Essentially, what you're doing is going from raw data to some refined data where you can make some decisions. Then we have controllers. There are functions, there are components, there are objects, whatever, uh, that will take these refined data and compute some decisions that will be uh, translated into uh, operations, invocations to actuators, okay? And these actuators will then have some effects on the environment, and this is the control uh, step, uh, stage of the sense compute control uh, paradigm. So again, this is something very uh, very general. It's, it's used in uh, robotics, it's used in um, everything that has to do with uh, home and, and, and um, building automations. And in fact, it can be used uh, in things that, are, that have nothing to do with uh, um, hardware entities, I mean hardware environments. Uh, one, one project that uh, an, um, a master's student worked on was to actually see that as the network, okay, you're doing some measurement on the network, okay, to see the available bandwidth, collisions, and things like that. And here you're making, you're making um, uh, multimedia adaptation strategies, okay, which are, um, and, and you have the, the, the corresponding actuators, okay, to adapt, okay, a video stream to uh, a situation in your network. So just to give you, and there are other examples where we have also monitoring for security systems also, where you have some measurements here of what's going on in your network and you're possibly taking some countermeasures okay, on possible attacks that you may have. So this is a very general, again, paradigm. Okay, and it's, a, it's an interesting intellectual game to actually take a, a given problem and to uh, phrase it in terms of uh, this uh, sense compute control paradigm. Okay, so let's talk about the case study that uh, we'll be looking at. So, like you, you can imagine, this has a, a plane has sensors and actuators. It's more and more software intensive. I mean, having talk, having in, uh, um, I've been collaborating with uh, this company, Thales, for more than 10 years now. And it's, it's just amazing uh, the, the amount of software that is arriving in, in planes. Uh, and, and this causes a lot of problems, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> there are th some things you don't want to hear about. <laughs> uh, so, so and, and, and obviously, you know, the safety critical issues are, are, are really uh, uh, a key issue here. And one thing that's uh, a key issue is the, the, the tracing of the requirements, functional and non-functional re requirement in 
the development life cycle. I mean, that's really a key thing. I have some requirements here, okay, some obvious requirements. How do they get translated, okay, into the software and, and you know, into the development and even into the runtime, okay, of my system? Okay, so, so, so requirements tracing is, 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 is a key thing here. For, um, to illustrate the sense compute control paradigm, uh, I'll be using, uh, uh, I'll be using a, a, um, a tool that we have developed in my group called Dia Suite. Okay, it's a, it's a suite of tools okay, that um, essentially implement this uh, development approach that I just outlined. Uh, it uh, revolves around the, uh, this sense compute control paradigm and uh, it has a language called Diaspect that I will use in order to uh, write the few examples I will present. So it has a design language and it allows you to um, design uh, the, the functional and non-functional aspects of a software system. Okay. Alright, so this is the big picture. Uh, you can imagine that if you start with the uh, functional requirements, so you do the functional design, you have some domain experts being uh, interested in the kind of uh, uh, sensors and actuators that you will be using for a given application. You have the software architecture that will be more looking into the, uh, uh, a particular application. We'll look at uh, the autopilot application today. Um, so here you have entities, you have various kinds of applications. So that's the, the functional design. Uh, for the non-functional design, there are many things you may be interested in, like dependability uh, issues, for instance. I mean, as you can see, there is a really a separation of concerns here. You can, you can work on the functional design and then work on, the, on various aspects of non-functional design. So here, dependability, for instance, and uh, it's, it's the, the, there's a safety expert here uh, that will be contributing to the design. So this is the diaspect description, the, the design description. And also there'll be some issues here as far as what to do with the errors or the faults that uh, happens, okay? So you'll see how this fits into uh, this development process that I will present. Um, so other kind of non-functional issues like uh, quality of service. Uh, there's also the testing. Um, so um, you'll see that uh, when you develop um, what's interesting, and, and this is a property of the paradigm that our tools actually uh, um, leverage, is the fact that you can, you can easily introduce simulation. Okay, um, and then um, there will be some deployment uh, phase that, I mean, that's the thing that we haven't uh, worked uh, too much on. So we have some, some basic deployment um, uh, strategies, but, but it's, it's, it's far from, from what we actually need to, uh, to do. So I won't be talking about that uh, too much. Okay, so uh, now, what about the application that I will use uh, for this talk? So this is the autopilot application, uh, because obviously we need to um, test this application. We will use a flight simulator called Flight Gear, okay, to do the, um, to do the, uh, the, the, the simulation. And it's, it's a quite quite an interesting uh, flight simulator because it has a very realistic uh, physical model um, and it really simulates all the, the, the hardware components that you have in real uh, aircraft. So, so it's quite, quite realistic for, for what we want to do. And it, it fits really well into the simulation, uh, uh, this simulation idea that um, I, I, I just uh, mentioned. Okay, so if we look at the actuators we have uh, on, on the plane, so we're going to use the wing level, the heading. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a, a expert, I'm not a pilot myself, so, so I, know, I know very little about those things. 
so there are some, some altitude control that you can see here. And one thing that we'll be interested in is uh, um, uh, managing a flight plan. Okay, so let's look at the functional view of that application. Uh, so this is the, the, the view we, we, we had uh, a minute ago, and I will illustrate the, um, this application using the design language that we uh, developed, which is called Diaspec. Okay, so there are the, first, the very first uh, step uh, in our methodology supported by Diaspec is to uh, define the taxonomy of entities that will be used for this, uh, uh, for, for, for an application in general and for this autopilot application specifically here. So what are the, the basic entities that is sensors and actuators that an autopilot application would need? Once this is done, we go into a second phase, which is to define the architecture, which is the actual application logic, okay, decomposed into two kinds of components the context components, remember the, those are the ones that are combining uh, the raw data and refining this data to uh, come up with um, uh, uh, refined data that can be used for decisions. And also the controllers, the controllers are the components that will, um, uh, that will uh, um, uh, decide the kind of decisions that can be made and translated into uh, actions for those actuators. Okay, so uh, this is an unfolded view of what you just saw. Um, let's look at the entities. So we will need different kinds of uh, entities for this autopilot. We'll need the, uh, some inertial unit, uh, uh, an autopilot GUI so that the autopilot can interact with, uh, with the autopilot uh, uh, application. Um, so, the, we're using different, different features of the inertial unit, the role, the, the heading, and the position, uh, and also we'll be using another um, entity, which is the, uh, uh, the route manager giving us the current waypoint. Okay, so this is the, the diaspec way of defining entities. So, as you will see, we put the emphasis here on the functionalities okay, of those entities. We don't say how they work, we just say what services they provide. Okay. Uh, so for instance here, the inertial unit, it says that it has three sources of information that you can see here. Okay. It gives you the role, the heading, and the position, and the type of the data produced. Okay. Uh, autopilot, same thing. So and these are the types that we will be using. All right. So again, this is, this is the domain expert that says, okay, what is the right interface okay, to the uh, uh, devices, to the entities that I need in order to write my application logic? Okay. And as, uh, um, as I was saying um, earlier with, uh, uh, to Nicholas, I mean, it, this, is, this is a key thing here is how, what, what level at which, you know, the level at which you provide this is, 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 a, is a real key. Um, okay, so if we look at an actuator, for instance, the LRON, uh, so this is the definition of an LRON, so it's really an interface, okay. Uh, it's an interface, uh, here it's an interface with just a single operation, which is the set value, okay, that will just, you give a value and it, it, it gives uh, the, the LRON uh, position. Uh, of course, a device can have a sensing uh, facet and an, an actuating facet. Okay, it can combine the two. And now this is the, so these are the entities, okay, the, the actuators, the sensors here. And now let's look at how we decompose, okay, this autopilot application. So we need something to compute the heading to reach the next waypoint. This is something for the global heading. This is something to compute the role to reach the uh, target heading. And this is something that computes the actual order okay, for the L run okay, to get the target role and to go to the right direction. Okay. So this is the decomposition that we have. Notice that here we are only in the context okay, uh, layer of our application. 
Okay? So this is how we define context components in diaspec. Okay? So here, uh, for instance, here it says the, this is the heading to current waypoint here. It uh, takes information from two entities. So here it says uh, context heading way, uh, to waypoint as float. That's what it's producing. And it's using two sources of information, two entities, current waypoint from route manager and position from inertial unit. Okay. So it's very simple. It's just, it's just saying you know, how things are happening. Okay. It's, it's describing the data flow okay, of the application. All right. So nothing, nothing you know, surprising to some extent at this point. But it's it's interesting piece of information for as far as the design is concerned. Okay. Um, let's look at a controller. Okay, the controller is the component that is called in order to invoke, to compute some orders uh, to the actuators. So here it says the controller. Uh, Lron controller needs the target Lron context, okay, and it will operate on the Lron uh, actuator, okay. That that's all it, we're saying here, okay. All right. So as you can see here, where we have defined the data flow, okay, of our application, all right, and. Um, but that's not enough because there are some ambiguities there. For instance, uh, how, are, how do I get those values? Okay? Do, I, do I pull the values or do I get the value pushed onto me? Okay? So that's, that's one possibility. I could get the value from the initial unit and then get, so I, I get pushed a value here as a target L1 and then I get the value from the target role. Okay? Or, okay, or it could be the other way around. I get a value from, from target role and then I pull a value from the initial unit okay, and then produce some value. So there is some ambiguity okay, and, and this is something, if you, if you have a design that's ambiguous, the, the net result is that you're going to have programmers that are going to make decisions at, as you can see here, at the scale of a, a safety critical system like this, you don't want the programmer to make the decisions. You want the design, the designer, to make the decisions. Okay. So we added a notion which is called the interaction contracts, okay, which will make those things more explicit. So in particular, for instance, there is uh, so we, we we introduce the notion of activation condition. So it says. For instance, here, uh, when I get a value from this component, uh, sorry, sorry, okay, all right, good. Uh, so when when I'm I'm uh, I'm being queried a value, okay, um, sorry, start again. Uh, I'm I'm being pushed a value here, okay. And I compute something, and uh, and and somehow um, th so that that's a, a, an activation condition. Another possible activation condition is some parent node, okay, requires some value from me, okay. When I'm activated, I may want to get some other values from other components, okay. Uh, so those are the required. Uh, the required data, okay, and ultimately I may or may not publish some value, okay. I may not publish some value because I'm not ready for it, okay, or I may publish a value always, okay. This is going to be specified in my uh, interaction contract, okay. So here is an example here. Uh, so this is what you saw previously, okay, and this is what we're adding. Uh, so this is an interaction contract, so it's really a behavior, okay. Uh, this is saying when provided heading from inertial unit, so this is what's happening here, okay. When I'm provided some value from the inertial unit, then, okay, I will get some value from target heading, this is a context component, 
and from the autopilot GUI, okay, this is a, an entity, okay, a sensor. Okay? So it's really describing the behavior, the, the control flow, if you wish. Yes? So the question is, is the get is the get blocked or blocking? Okay. Uh, so um, yes, there it's it's a synchronous uh, call. So you have if and and we will see that this has this has a, a key importance uh, when you um, have to take into account uh, dependability issues. Okay, obviously. So you will see that this control flow information that we're adding with this interaction contract, okay, is actually opening up po opportunities for non-functional uh, issues. Okay. Um, okay. So, right, so these are the advantages. We're abstracting, okay, one thing that's important is that we're abstracting over connectors. In fact, we don't have connectors in our design language. If you know about architectural description languages, okay, traditionally uh, an, architecture, uh, an architecture is a decomposition of a software system into components and connectors. Okay. So here we don't have any connectors. Or connectors are just control flow abstractions, okay, and we don't have to add explicit things. Okay. It's more at the language level here. Uh, of course, we have some programming support that we can generate from that. I mean, this is valuable information. So that means we can, we can really generate quite a bit of support for the programmer. Okay? And you'll see that in a moment. And we can do some communication integrity here. That is, making sure that uh, the implementation okay, uh, implements interactions that are only conformant with the design. Okay? All right, so so we're, we're, we're making things more precise so that the implementation be as accurate as possible with respect to the design. Okay, um, so let's see. Uh, uh, okay, so in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll skip, well, I'll, I'll go quickly there. It's, it's, this, is, this, is, uh, this is the, uh, the LRON, okay. We generate an abstract class, okay. So this is, this is really, remember the LRON is an abstract entity, okay? So this is the place where you actually write what you could call a device driver if we were in an operating system context, okay? So this is really a device driver, but we generate some skeleton, okay, in, in the form of an abstract class that you have to extend, so it's a skeleton that doesn't have the problems of the code skeleton, skeleton because you just extend the class. Okay, where you have to implement that particular thing here, okay, that will make the control to the to the to the L run. Okay, so this is the device driver you write. Okay, very very localized piece of code. All right, so let's look at the application. So the application, remember the context here. We also generate an abstract class here. Okay, and of course all the abstract methods are things you need as a programmer. You as a programmer need to write. Okay. So in, 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 in IDEs uh, like, like Eclipse, it's, it's really a piece of cake because you extend the thing and it tells you exactly what methods to implement. Okay. So this is what happens here. You extend that, that abstract class here and, and you have to, you know, to implement a few things like this. Okay. Notice that here, okay, remember that this guy, okay, this context needs this, uh, a source uh, inertia unit and uh, um, a context, and it, it, it gets activated, okay, uh, by the target role. So the target role is right here, okay, and when it gets activated, it needs a handle, okay, on the inertia unit in order to pull the value, right. In order to have communication integrity, we only, we only give you a handle on what you're supposed to interact with, essentially. And this is, this is why we have this extra parameter here, okay? Because this particular component can only, with respect to this, interact with the inertial unit, we give you a handle, 
okay, on the inertial unit. What it means is that you cannot interact with anything but the inertial unit. Okay? And this is how we actually constructively okay, give you communication integrity. Okay? So the test is something we do, as I said, with the, uh, the uh, flight gear. So we have this flight gear and the physical model of an airplane. We emulate the entities. And this is easy to emulate the entities. Remember, we have those device drivers. We just have to write different device drivers. Okay, not to the real thing, but to an emulated thing. Okay? So that means that the application code doesn't, doesn't change. Okay? Because, I mean, when we activate an entity, we don't know whether it's a real entity or whether it's an emulated entity. And we don't care. Okay? Um, so that, that thing doesn't, doesn't change. It's only the device drivers that actually change. Okay? All right? So, right. So we can do hybrid simulation, which we, we in fact, do. Uh, in this particular example, because we have an actual computer as, a, as an autopilot, uh, as the pilot GUI, okay, and everything else is, is, is actually simulated, okay. Um, right, so just to, to, to summarize a little bit on what I, I promised we, we would do, so, so we're covering the development life cycle. We have a design language that is leveraged to actually generate dedicated programming support and simulation support. Okay. We have a paradigm-oriented methodology, and that's quite useful because, you know, like you, you use a programming paradigm like an object-oriented language in order to help you kind of f uh, formalize, decompose, organize your thoughts. Okay. We give you a sense compute control paradigm with the design language that goes with it in order to help you organize your design thoughts. Okay. Um, and we have a high-level high methodology that really abstracts over uh, you know, the, the actual environment and the, the entities that interact with the environment. Okay, so let me quickly show the uh, dependability issues. So I won't, I won't explain the, um, the QoS uh, part of it, just to, to give you some a flavor of the dependability. Um, so um, we want, at the design level, which is, which is the, the interesting thing here, is that we want to characterize the kind of errors that may happen in our software system. Okay. So we want to specify the exceptional component behavior. Remember that, that in, 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 in programming languages, uh, I mean, this is something you have to encode, really. Okay. So uh, error handling is a real problem as far as maintainability and evolution and also uh, certification of code. So what we want and what we wanted in this, this, this part of our project is to specify error handling at the design level. Okay. Um, so potential errors, so of course you have to start with a, a safety analysis to, for instance, to understand what kind of fault models okay, that you will be considering for what entities. Uh, and for the autopilot uh, uh, application, I mean, there are some requirements, okay? Requirements like, okay, you have to unplug or to switch off the autopilot if, for instance, some uh, navigation entity like the inertial unit, okay, uh, fails, for instance, okay? So, of course, you have to unplug that, okay, and to give back the control to the pilot. This is a requirement, okay? How can you translate that requirement into the programming language? So, as it turns out, in the programming language, it's pretty low level. You'd like to express that at a design level, and you'd like the, 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 the programming to be in conformance with the design requirements. Okay? Um, so, uh, here's an example here, the inertial unit that may have some, say, electrical system exception. Okay? So, this is, this is your... your um, um, your analysis, okay, that gave you that, okay, and it says that you, you may have this, this error that may happen here, okay, the, the, the safety analysis gives you that. What's interesting here is that, as you can see, it, when you have an error here, okay, different things may happen. As you were, as you were uh, mentioning, Veronica, the, the, 
if you pull some value okay, from the initial unit okay, and there's an error, okay, it failed somehow, you have to handle that thing. Okay? You, you, I mean, you, there's something to be done there. Okay? And it's, uh, it's, uh, you have to react to that. Okay? Now, it's different when the initial unit pushes some values. Right? Because then there, there's no consumers per se. Right? Uh, if the initial unit fails, okay, well, the consumers never get pushed any values. Okay? But that's fine. I mean, it's an event thing. So that means that that error will have to be somehow handled without consumers. So you can imagine that there is some kind of a management level of your system. Okay? So what we call a system level handling of errors. Okay? And as you can see, this is completely connected to the interaction contracts. Because the interaction contracts says, you know, who is consumers, okay, who is pulling values, who, in, who is getting pushed values. So there you can see how important okay, the control flow information becomes. Okay? So this is, this is the example here. All right, so how do we handle that? So we may handle it at the application level when there is a consumer, okay? So when somebody pulled values, okay? Or, uh, so this is, this is an example here, okay? So here we have, um, right, so here, uh, so we, we, what we do uh, here is that, as you can see, with uh, square brackets, we added, okay, uh, annotations, okay? Okay, so I showed you in the entities that the entities are the places where you will say what errors may occur, okay? And now in the application, you have to say, the designer has to say whether or not a particular component will be handling the error. So here, for instance, we have this annotation that says skipped catch, okay? What it means is that I don't want, as a, as a designer, I don't want that component to handle that ca the, 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 um, the uh, error that may be resulting from uh, getting a value from target heading. Okay? So here, again, as a designer, I don't want this, com this component okay, to be handling an error in the autopilot GUI. Okay? For, for a... Um, uh, for certification pro purposes, this is interesting because what it says is that, for instance, I can, I can um, uh, uh, give the development of a particular component to a company that doesn't have the highest trust level, okay, as far as code quality, for instance. Because in the design, I did specify that I don't want those errors to be handled by that component. So that component can be developed by a company that has, maybe doesn't have, you know, the highest possible trust, okay, all right. Now, on, on, the, on the contrary, okay, when I say, so I, I believe there is a, right, so, so this, is, this is what happens here, uh, which is when this thing gets activated, then I get some values, and here I specify that I don't want, to, I don't want that, those components to deal with the values. Let me go to another example. So, right, so the action here, okay, at the system level is when you don't pull a value, but you get pushed a value. So there's no consumers when the entity fails, for instance, there's no consumers to report the error to. Okay, so this is dealt, dealt with at the, the system level. Uh, so that's why we have those two levels of error handling at the application level, when I have consumers for values that are not being that, that, are, that are being emitted by failing entities, or at the system level, when there's no consumers. Okay, uh, so what happens here is that when something like that happens, for instance, this is when I turn off, for instance, the autopilot okay, uh, application, saying, no, I can't go on with this autopilot thing because some important uh, entities okay, failed, so I cannot, I cannot ensure uh, that function anymore. Okay, so there is this idea that at the system level here, okay, I have, I'm able to design what happens when this fails here, okay, 
So as you can see, this is not just a, a visual representation of the die aspect description. It says, well, when this fails, okay, I do some computations here, and eventually, okay, uh, I, I, I realize this, there are some maybe unsafe modes, okay, that I need to deactivate, okay, and so essentially to uh, um, require the pilot, okay, to uh, take control, okay. So at the implementation, of course, this is, this is uh, used because, again, we have some design, okay, and we have some kind of implementation obligations, okay, that we are uh, imposing to the programmer. So, so here, for instance, this says, um, because I, I declared the rays here, okay, in the abstract class, okay, I, 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 uh, 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 that is generated automatically, also is generated automatically a method, okay, that will be able to push the error, okay, to, to, to essentially publish the error, okay, which is something that I, I can then use here, okay, uh, I publish the error here, okay, so I give support essentially, I give support, okay, to, to uh, publish errors that have been declared here, okay, so when I, when I write my, my device driver, okay, my device driver, will uh, have support, okay, to trigger errors, okay? What it means is that it will use my support, the support that I generated, in order to trigger errors. So I can make sure that those errors are correctly uh, triggered, okay, emitted, okay, and delivered to the right consumers, okay? All right? Okay, let me go a little quick on those uh, last slides. So this is the skipped, uh, the skipped catch that I told you about. So essentially here it says I just get a raw information from the inertial unit, okay, but there's no error handling. I have no ways of handling an error, okay, because it's a skipped catch, okay. Yes. That's right. How is that related with the try catch? Okay, so it, it's, we don't use the exception mechanisms of, of the object-oriented language. We use our own, um, we, essentially, we essentially map, okay, uh, exceptions into events. So you have a little framework? Yes. Your own framework for That's right. events? That's right. You use events for something more than we, we use the event every time you, you have an entity, for instance, or a, a, a context component that um, you remember when, when I say when provided something in the interaction contract. So when provided means that it's in, I'm supposed to get okay uh, to get the thing, and so that uses the event an event mechanism. One final question. Sure. Yes, yes. So, but you have added a mechanism, right. a framework for right. dealing with events. Yes, and in fact, so this is something that, uh, in fact, we like to think of it in a more semantic way, okay? And what we want to do is to essentially see, in fact, there are many possible implementations. So we're working on the, on the semantics, okay, of this mechanism, and we show that you can, in fact, instantiate this event mechanism of us, okay, in very, very different ways, okay, and that, that's, that's, that's very important, in fact, because then you can have, you know, uh, concurrent versions of it, you can have multi-threaded versions of it, you can have sequential versions of it, and, and you respect the semantics. So let me go quickly to the testing, okay, so, so we have some, some, uh, some testing, um, uh, let, right, this, so this is the summary, I'm sorry, this is a summary of, of, uh, of uh, what I just talked about. And what, the key thing to remember is the separation of concerns that we're introducing. And error handling is really done uh, at the design level, but in a very separated way, okay, in a sense that you can, you can really deal with that in a separated way from the functional, from the functional uh, design. Um, 
Okay, this is about, uh, I have two slides to go, I think, or maybe one. Uh, so, right, so we have, we have uh, done this, um, uh, interestingly, this uh, autopilot thing with a drone. So I can, I can show you the, the, the video, it's very quick, it's just a minute or something. Uh, so, uh, interestingly there, we, we use the uh, AR drone, the part drone, and, and what, what's interesting there is that you have some middleware, and the interesting question was, what entities do we need to essentially identify or extract, okay, in order to have the right controls, okay, over the drone, okay? So it was a very interesting thing, using all the sensors and actuators that were there, like the cameras, for instance, okay? Um, so we're doing, uh, as I said before, we're doing a lot of home building automation with exactly the same kind of sense compute control and diaspec and all this, okay? This, this really works very well in this particular context. And of course, uh, one way of doing home building automation is to do also assisted living because there are things that are obviously, there's an intersection between those two fields. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, these, these two things, they take the, they take the form, uh, this, this instance of Dye Suite is really uh, uh, an instance where we introduce the notion of a, of a store of applications. So the idea is that uh, we give you the uh, possibility to write tons of applications using our Dye Spec uh, language and, and use Java. Uh, as the implementation language, and you can ship that into uh, some store. There are some verifications that are being done, and then as a user, okay, you can you can go online, look at the interesting applications that you'd like to deploy in your house, okay, and you can you can essentially select the ones you're interested in, for which you have the hardware, if hardware's hardware entities are required, of course, um, and you install them, and and they work. Uh, perfectly nicely, and and one, I mean, among the the interesting uh, um, benefits of our approach is one is the fact that we know exactly uh, what kind of resources you'll be using. That's because of you have entities. Two, uh, we can do a lot of uh, verifications, making sure that, for instance, there's there's no privacy breach, for instance, in applications, because again, we know the data flow, control flow, okay, of at the design level. Okay, and we can enforce it at the uh, implementation level. So we know that you cannot write some malicious applications. And, um, and the other uh, last uh, advantage is the fact that we are very uh, portable. That is, you can write an application without knowing what are the actual entities, hardware entities that will exist. And that's, that's also very important. Um, so we're doing some work on other non-functional properties. Uh, like quality of service I talked about already, the access control to resources, security and deployment, those are two things that we're working on these days. Uh, some testing, uh, we did some work on simulation and some work, um, um, actually some work on also on uh, energy consumption with Walid using Acumen for the uh, physical model, uh, continuous models. Uh, so this also shows how our, our work can be coupled with uh, um, uh, 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 tools for, 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 uh, um, for better simulation, really. Uh, the two things we are most interested in is user interaction. Okay, we're interested in uh, introducing the notion of interaction in the design. Right now, the design, as you saw, okay, doesn't have the human in the loop, if you wish. Okay, we would like to be able to express interaction with users okay, in the design. And there are very, very good reasons for that. I mean, you'd like to make sure that, for instance, an application uh, does require interaction at the right moment, okay, if it's required, okay, so you'd like to make sure that interaction is required, okay. So this is, can be very important uh, if you're monitoring patients, if you are a pilot and you want to make sure that any kind of, you know, certain kind of decisions can only be made with the approval of the pilot, for instance, okay? Um, and also you want to make sure that some, um, that, that some interactions 
uh, for instance, don't happen in certain, uh, uh, in certain situations. But one, another situation from, from avionics is, is you don't want, for instance, in some critical situations, you don't want to, uh, certain interactions to happen because they are not priority. Uh, you know, in, because it's a safety critical situations, for instance. But same thing for a patient, okay? So you don't want certain patients to be bugged, okay, by a, a system. So, so introducing the interaction dimension in the design is actually very interesting because it allows you to then reason about the design and making sure that certain situations do happen or don't happen, okay? Um, all right, so if you, if you want to just look at the... Uh, I can show you quickly, uh, right, this is it, um, the, uh, the drone, uh, okay, so, so this is, this is, uh, this is in our lab, so you have some, you have some, uh, some basic tags here with colors, see here, and so this is for the location inside the lab, okay, <laughs> so, so we have entered a flight plan, okay, uh, and, and those are data points for the, so you can see it turns around, okay, and it follows our flight path, okay, in a, in a kind of confined environment, as you can see, <laughs> okay, and this is all developed in, in, in Diaspec, and using the, the down camera, okay, that is processing the images, okay, and using the, the visual tags here, okay. And, and the whole point is, is, again, what kind of sensors and actuators are you going to make uh, apparent? And then the application becomes really uh, simple and, and interesting. Okay, that's it. Do you have uh, questions? Thank you very much, uh, Charles. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, from the audience. This one. Thank you. Oh, okay, okay. This is this is in Java. I'm sorry. I should have made that clear. So, so the question was from the design, how do you implement the design? And, and so you implement the design in Java. So the idea is to, to leverage, I mean, this is what I was mentioning before, is that you know, we introduce a new language, okay, but we leverage a mainstream language. So we introduce a new language for the design because, for instance, Java doesn't do any design, right? So we are complementary to Java in that regard. Oh. As I've heard, are not uh, suiting well because they, if you want to qualify a Java language, then you have yes, to yes. Big work. <laughs> this is this is. Why did you choose the Java? This is well because we do research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, well, because because uh, you know just simply. We w this is a, a proof of concept more than something that you know the company can use tomorrow. In, 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 indeed, you're absolutely right. They don't use Java. Okay, uh, they use C, C++, but they don't use Java. So, uh, but what we wanted to do was was to take their, to take uh, problems that they had. Okay, and we wanted to um, essentially illustrate the benefits of our technology. Uh, and, and to be as realistic as possible in doing so. That's why we used flight gear, which is, even them, I mean, they said that it was a, it was a very realistic uh, flight simulator, okay, aircraft model. I mean, there are, uh, the aircraft models are ap apparently very accurate. And we used the drone as well, as, you know, to get as close as possible to, to the real thing, okay. But I, I completely agree uh, Java is out of the question <laughs> for for in the avionics domain. I, I fully agree with that. Yeah. Uh, the DS suite. Uh, as, um, uh, my impression was that uh, you are doing the software design when you know how the functions are deployed to the hardware. Uh, meaning that uh, I, I think the autopilot maybe is a good example. Uh, I'm from the by the way from automotive, so I have another terminology. I use, but I would try to describe uh, because I mean, if you develop uh, uh, automotive, there is, for example, one 
uh, unit or uh, hardware in the dashboard, and there is another unit somewhere else, and then probably you have the sensors uh, for the uh, flight speed, and then the, uh, actuators like the flaps and so on. So they are very distributed, the functionality of the different hardware. Yes. And did you take that into account in the DS suite as well, that it's such a distributed uh, environment where you have buses and uh, everything? So this is, this is where the deployment yeah. dimension comes into the picture. Okay. And this is where, uh, as I said, this is where we, we, we I mean, we don't have any, any key results there yet, okay? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, in, in, in a plane, uh, in the avionics domain, it's the same thing. I mean, they, they, it's a distributed architecture, okay? So, so they talk about it from a, a functional viewpoint, and then they have to, they do this work, which is a key, uh, a key step, which is to, to uh, uh, map the, uh, the, the functional architecture into a physical architecture, okay? And this is where they start talking to the, so it, it's, a, it's a complicated thing, because you, you have to, indeed, figure out where you place your entities, okay? Uh, you have to figure out also what kind of bandwidth you, you need, Okay, because I mean this is same as automotive, I guess you have so you you, um, you have to make sure that uh, uh, everything is well dimensioned. I mean that you, you don't you don't use too much bandwidth, and so you couple things differently, and uh, and also you have uh, the additional uh, problem that you have now. Before you had a custom custom made architectures. Now they use general purpose processes, okay, and they have tasks running on those processes, okay? So, so th there, are, there are tons of, of issues to consider at the deployment yeah. uh, phase. So th my question was if you uh, make a difference between the functional modeling and the deployment, and you yeah, So we, we, we start, we, 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 are making, yeah. we are making some differences, yeah, we are making some, some, some work in mapping a functional design into a physical Architecture, yes, yes, but we don't have key results yet okay. on, on this particular part. And that leads me to my last question about uh, uh, timing perspective, because as you said also, I mean, uh, if you have distributed systems, you are, uh, there will be conflicts with other functions that are uh, com competing on the same uh, media. And do you regard, uh, have you have time, such as timing requirements and max So uh, the question is, do we have timing requirements? Yeah. Uh, so we do. Uh, this is the quality of service contracts that I didn't talk about. So there's a paper on that where we annotate the design uh, description with quality of service uh, contracts. So for instance, you can say, uh, I require okay, every you know, 10 milliseconds okay, a measure of my position or my altitude or whatever. Okay? So, and, and you can you can say uh, uh, and I re, uh, you know I want I want my my position and altitude every you know ten milliseconds for instance okay so you can you can have those those uh, quality of service contracts okay and what we do is that one we verify that uh, based on the specifications okay of the entities we verify that those uh, that certain contracts can be fulfilled. Okay, for other contracts, we generate runtime um, runtime support, okay, and we introduce um, uh, new kinds of exceptions on contract violation. Okay, so so we do some wrapping of components, okay, in uh, in order to uh, handle, okay, contract violations. Okay. And, and again, this is the power of uh, uh, generative programming. Okay. So why did one contradict me on this one, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, this is, this is really where it comes into the picture. I mean, this is why we believe, uh, I mean, this is why we're in the same community in this generative programming idea is that, is that you, you do leverage the, 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 um, the, the generation of code there, okay, so you, you use some design information and you generate some, some support, okay, and, and this is where we, we, we get extra mileage there, because, yeah. So, uh, my last question, uh, uh, I'm, uh, as I said, automotive uh, area, and uh, regarding timing, I see uh, in 
general, uh, it's have a low priority because they, they typically, I mean, LPW has almost 100 instruments today. And I mean, the number of functionalities, they basically have uh, not, they don't know, and they so much with private requirements from the beginning. So they basically just test it until it works. But obviously, if you have a certain combination or then there will be a tiny problem. Uh, and my question is, if, what is your uh, experience on the aerospace? Are they also considered tiny requirements as a so are they considering timing requirements as a low priority yeah, or, uh, is that in a very, uh, a vital part of the uh, design process it, it, it is a vital part of the of the design it is a vital part and in fact uh, this is when they talk to their um, um, uh, so uh, you know typically in in the the avionics domain I mean uh, the the Aircraft makers see themselves as um, uh, integrating. They call that systems of systems, okay? Because they integrate, you know, they integrate systems. So at each level, if, if you look at the subsystem of an airplane, that's already a huge system, and they, they they think about themselves as you know building systems of systems. So so yes, it it is a key thing, and they they go and talk to their equipment makers, okay, and. And this is how they go around and choose whatever, whichever equipment. So there's a whole phase there that actually was described to me by one of my students working with Thales, is, is, is all the, the, the care they, they, they put into choosing the equipment, the specific, technical specifications, and then checking that what they call a functional chain okay, uh, works in, in a specific time bound, like for instance, uh, the pilot needs to have a refreshed view of its alt of his altitude. Okay, every I don't know uh, uh, milliseconds or every uh, you know every second, let's say. So they make sure that this whole functional chain, okay, is guaranteed. Okay, from the hardware to the to the to the software. Okay, so so from from essentially the sensors to the actuators. Okay, from the sensors, you know. Uh, getting the altitude to the display. Okay, they they, they want to make sure that if it's you know, you know every second the, the a refreshed view of the altitude, so that that needs to be, or that you know whatever alarm needs to be triggered within you know a tenth of a second when something happens, they have to check those function what they call the functional chains. Okay, so so it is a key priority for them, and they have to they have to essentially. Uh, when they do this, this certification process, they have to convince. They don't automate anything, or not much, but they have to convince the certification uh, body that you know, this, this will be uh, uh, done you know, within the, the required uh, uh, time. Yeah. So it's a key thing. It's a key in the certification process. It's a key thing. Yes. These, these were really great questions, and yes, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, if you're familiar with some of the details of certification for airline software, but my understanding is that in many times they look at the machine code, and they go over the machine code to make sure that it satisfies the properties that that, that they want. So that kind of limits the ability of, of of people producing the software to do fancy things. Uh, when you have to look at the assembly code and make sure that everything is understandable and it satisfies all the properties that you expect. So it's very... It, it's very it's tedious. I mean, they, they, they start with the requirements, okay, and they make sure that that requirement doesn't get lost, okay, along the way, okay, and you have to make sure that it is present in the code and that if need be, okay, it is present at runtime, okay, and it will behave the way uh, you know, in conformance with the requirement. So, so the, 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 it's a pretty tedious, uh, tedious process. And it, it is a negotiation in, in a sense that it's not a, you know, you push a button and it says yes or it says no, it says I don't know. It, it, it's really uh, something you have to, uh, you know, they sit down and <laughs> they negotiate. They, I mean, they, they, they try to convince the, yeah. Curious about the specification language is uh, uh, and and how how you go from the specification. One of the scenarios I was thinking was that you you mentioned this 
kind of app store where you could download uh, services based on that you had a given set of hardware. So you could think of different manufacturers of hardware. So let's say that we're in a home automation setting and we have a temperature sensor. So depending if the sensor is produced or manufactured in, in, uh, in the US or in, in Sweden, it might be different scales of this temperature sensor. And I didn't see a, a scale or a scale unit of, of, of the specification. So that's what would happen if you would have a Fahrenheit temperature sensor? That's a, a, a great question. Thank you. So what, what, what happens, what happens uh, how do I deal with heterogeneity, essentially? Um, so um, so this, is, this, is where, uh, this is where you have to um, um, put a lot of effort in designing the functionality of the sensors. So uh, here, um, in fact, getting a temperature is kind of a simple thing, right? It's just a value, okay? Um, what we do uh, is that we have this configuration, okay? Uh, this configuration step, okay? Where you would indeed uh, specify whether it's Fahrenheit, for instance, or Celsius, okay, in the configuration step of the application. Hopefully, hopefully, if things have been done the right way, that should uh, compensate for this variation that exists, okay, because we have this, again, this configuration, uh, this configuration, uh, uh, wh whenever, we, whenever I install a, a, an application, okay, well, it's a design time feature in the sense that at design time, okay, when I designed the application, okay, I took into account the notion that there are two kinds of temperatures, okay, Celsius and Fahrenheit, okay, and so what I did is that I parameterized my application with respect to that. So when you install the application, you say, okay, am I in Fahrenheit or Celsius, okay, and that is of course taken into account in my calculations of my application. So it is not done at the device level, it's done at the application level in this particular case. In this, I mean, this is, this is what comes to mind. I mean, th this is how I would leverage the, 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 the configuration, the, the parameterization idea. Uh, and, and to go a little further on, uh, on your question, um, the idea in, the, in this store is that we define a taxonomy of what a house is or a building is for us. Okay, so we say a house or a building has, you know, lights I can control, for instance, or it has temperatures, it has uh, light sensors, it has, uh, you know, locks, automatic locks. You know. So I define that as being like the 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 kind of the universal, the the universe of devices. Okay, not being actual devices, but more like idealized devices. So what it means is that then. Uh, developers can develop as many applications as they want based on that that kind of taxonomy okay and of course when you download an application if some devices are missing it will say well you know sure I'll install it but you know you need to get a, a webcam and uh, whatever uh, a light switch you know uh, something okay z-wave light switch and then then the application will run correctly okay but, but, it, but it allows the developers to envision applications without knowing who's going to be using. Okay, so, so it's more like, you know, oh, wouldn't it be nice if I had an application that would do this and that? Okay, so look up the, the taxonomy. Yeah, it's, it's defined there. I have a light switch, I have a, you know, luminis, the luminosity sensor, and I have a, an automatic door lock, whatever. Good, fine, I'll just write up my application you know, publish it on the store, and whoever has the same problem as me, well, use it. It works. Okay? And, and if need be, I'll have a little parameterization thing, you know, a few parameters that people can, can have in order to customize the application to their uh, home. Like, for instance, oh, I want this application to run in my bedroom, by the way. So I have a small question. It seems to me, uh, this follow-up to uh, Nicholas's question, that from the software engineering point of view, things are evolving in the direction of uh, services and uh, service-oriented architecture. So in this particular case, for example, uh, the issue of units, it sounds like it would be resolved by some kind of negotiation between the user or the consumer of the service and the provider of the service. 
the, the system would somehow ask, provide me with a Fahrenheit temperature or a temperature with these properties. And then the service would say, OK, well, I have these and these kinds of temperatures. I can, I can provide you with these. And then they would negotiate, and it would converge into something like that, into the, into the right one that they both agree on. Uh, that's right, that's right. I mean, you could, you could imagine, imagine using, using a negotiation, negotiation protocol like, like they do actually in, in, in a session initiation protocol in SIP. They use the, the, the session description protocol where they uh, uh, essentially you can negotiate the codec that you're using. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that would be an option. And with the contracts and the SLEs, it seems that things are yeah. kind of moving in that direction. And, uh, yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah. So, so right. So you, you're talking about reuse and and how I can use this approach Tech to existing libraries, for instance, the software libraries. Right. So um, uh, it, it's a good question. Um, uh, I, I think so far. I mean, we we've looked at it from different angles. Okay. From uh, let's say an app store kind of a, kind of a angle. Well, th there's not really reuse. I mean, reuse is actually done at the level of, a, of sensors and actuators, right? So for instance, if you want to share a calendar, for instance, well, you have the API, and, and, and that becomes a, an entity, OK, that, that you can sense or that can, you can actuate, OK? And uh, so the, sensors, the, the reuse is really done at the, the level of entities, what we call entities. Uh, and the apps are doing, you know, specific things that are not shared, uh, like you know, using the same paradigm as a smartphone, uh, you know, apps. Um, at the uh, at the um, at an, another level, like like the the um, uh, an aircraft software for an aircraft, uh, it, it would be interesting to see. We 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 haven't we haven't pushed. Uh, the work to the point where you know we're building software and software and software and then you know of course we need to reuse how do we reuse things we we, we don't have this 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 experience there so um, I really can't say so we were thinking you know before to say okay we 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 make up some uh, application okay and you know like, like they do in component oriented architectures where you have you know components and composite components okay so you can group, compose many components together and have a bigger component and this is how you get reuse. So we, we thought, okay, at some point or another we'll get to that point and we'll add, you know, whatever is necessary to be able to do that. We haven't developed big enough pieces of software that we need that construct. But maybe this will happen. I, I, I really can't say today. Charles, I think uh, I'm fairly confident there is coffee and cake outside. So at this point, we can continue the discussions uh, with having while having the coffee and cake. But uh, I'd like to thank you one more time and present a small present to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> and, you. Very uh, much. Thank you.